Today we have prepared uh, a nice program with uh, distinguished uh, talks. Uh, and the first of them is the talk of Dr. Kamal Akaya. Um, for those of you who don't know him, Dr. Kamal is an associate professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Florida International University. Dr. Akaya um, leads uh, the Advanced Wireless and Security Lab in uh, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. He is uh, well known for his work on different uh, issues of wireless networks, including uh, sensor networks, uh, smart grid communication networks, and big red networks. Dr. Akaya is a senior member of IEEE. He is an area editor of FCD Ad Hoc Networks Journal. He serves on the board of many journals. He also, um, over the last years, he published over 100 uh, papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. He has received the top-sided article award from Elsevier in 2010. So, uh, so uh, we are very fortunate to have him as a keynote speaker today. And his talk will be about um, a uh, relatively new topic in uh, vehicular communications. It's about the, inter the interconnection of vehicles to the smart grid. So we are talking about electric vehicles. Okay, so I will ask you to welcome with me Dr. Akaya. Okay, thank you, Samaya, for the nice introduction. Um, when Samaya asked me to talk about vehicle and networks, I was thinking I, I, I did research on vehicle and networks in the past. Uh, this has been there for maybe 10 years. I, I thought there's not much exciting uh, from my research perspective. I uh, later decided that you know I'm doing smart grid communication research. Uh, can I link it with uh, SmartBit? And uh, she said that would be great. So I decided to give you perspective um, uh, from the SmartBit uh, research, what's happening there in terms of uh, you know electric vehicles. And uh, this talk will be mostly uh, summarizing uh, what's happening, what are the challenges. Uh, we, we are doing some work, but I'm not going to get into a lot of technical details. So it'll be mostly um, uh, a summary of research challenges, open issues, etc. So we're focusing on security and privacy, but because be, before that, I would like to start with um, what's happening with the, the electric vehicles, or sometimes called the uh, plug-in electric vehicles, or different names. Um, so I, I uh, decided to use plug-in electric vehicles. So these are becoming widely available. You may or may not know, or you may see those vehicles uh, available uh, already. And there are a number of reasons for this, especially in the U.S. <coughs> there was this smart grid initiative uh, starting from 2009 uh, when Obama administration um, started this legislation. Uh, they put a lot of um, funding for smart grid and smart grid is a huge thing of course but part of it is uh, uh, the goal is to reduce the, the emissions uh, the carbon dioxide, dioxide emissions and uh, that's why it that takes us to uh, uh, electric vehicles so when we say environmental that's actually referring to that and that was the, one of the uh, main motivations and of course, there are other benefits, energy benefits, and economic reasons, but uh, this is picking up. So we expect that there will be um, like one million electric vehicles already on the roads by 2019. So it's like it only started, but we'll hopefully see more. We'll pick up after 2020. And uh, <coughs> you see some examples of these vehicles, like. Um, Tesla's, this, this was a, um, one of the first 
um, Roadster and Nissan had Leaf and Chevy has Bolt, it's, and there, I'm sure there are a number of uh, others that uh, you're seeing. Uh, it is not widely used yet, but there is, uh, you may hit a lot of uh, charging stations. Um, so that's, that's the major issue here. Uh, since these are electric vehicles, um, the charging is a problem. So what is the problem here exactly is that it, it is a lot of power. It requires 20 times more power than supporting a typical North American home. And uh, as you may know, North American homes, uh, you know, we are consuming more here than the rest of the world because we have large houses. So you can imagine it's, it's a lot of um, power. And uh, the problem is that if you have a lot of these vehicles, uh, like the, they call it loads in, in terms of power systems research, and they are aggregated and uncoordinated, then that can stress the power grid at certain locations. So what does that mean for those who are not familiar with uh, power grid or power system research? Um, their actually main concern is to make sure that the power grid um, is not stressed, so they, they monitor closely the this, this state of the power grid because if it's stressed at some point and you may experience lightouts which can um, create uh, a lot of problems in a cascading manner. So they, they monitor cl closely the, the state of the um, power grid and make sure that if there is a problem there um, they actually um, move flows around. So that's, that's a challenge, but at the same time there's an opportunity here because these batteries for electric vehicles uh, can be used as a storage, distributed storage, energy storage system because it's a huge battery. It's, it's about um, 50, maybe more than 50 kilowatt hour uh, if it's fully charged. Um, which means you can actually supply energy to a typical home in the U.S. for several days. So let's say there's a, there's a um, storm, hurricane, tornado, whatever, and we are experiencing these kind of lighthouse, uh, especially in the Midwest. Um, so you can use um, these, if you have such a uh, vehicle, you can use that vehicle to actually feed um, power to your house. So that's, that's a big advantage because storage is the main problem uh, in, uh, in power research. So this is an opportunity and the other opportunity here is that um, you can actually store renewable power to these batteries. Now they would like to promote renewables, right? And we all know the, the major source of power electricity is coming from coal, nuclear, right? Um, so it's like maybe 10% 10, 10 is, is coming from renewables. When we say renewables can be solar or, or wind, right? The problem with, I bet, that's a clean energy, right? And it's a hot topic and there's a lot of um, support for it. But the problem is that uh, these energy resources are not stable. So you're not always getting wind, you're not always getting solar, right? Depends on the weather. And that's why when you rely on them, sometimes you may have problems because it's not always there, right? Um, so this creates a lot of fluctuations. So that's, that's the reason that they want to actually store that um, power somewhere and then once you have enough um, power, you can actually use it later. So this is an, an, an opportunity here that we can actually store these, uh, uh, charge these batteries when, for instance, if you're using wind power, right? So you can charge it um, during the wind periods, right? And then you can provide it back to the grid during high load periods, so let's say there's, there's, there's a need at, at some point in a particular neighborhood, then you can use that excess um, battery um, from the um, electric vehicles. Right? So this 
can provide a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, research and, and people are working on it from the power systems uh, research community. So because of these advantages, this is, um, this is great, it's picking up, but uh, there is this challenge here. We need to communicate with the grid about charging, discharging, right? So what do we mean by communicating with the grid? Uh, we are talking about different cases. We are talking about, for instance, home charging. Say um, you have an electric vehicle, and typically right now, what they consider is that you can charge them at your home. Uh, by the way, these these for for charging at home, you need a like the box, it's not regular. Lot, right? Uh, so you can have that installed in your house and then you can charge your vehicle during the night, right? Um, but you can imagine that if there's a lot of people with electric vehicles in the neighborhood and they're charging at the same time, that can be a problem, right? So I was talking about uncoordinated charging at the beginning. So this stresses the grid and, and there's a need to uh, organize this to coordinate coordinate this uh, with the with the grid, right? So you need to have a connection with the grid. Can we do this with um, different means like advanced metering infrastructure? There is this advanced metering infrastructure uh, connecting our smart meters to the to the company to the grid, right? So can we use that? That's an option. The other thing is that the main thing here is actually the charging station. So Part of it is, is that when we have electric vehicles, we will need charging stations or call aggregators. Why do we need them? Well, you can charge them at home, yes, that's, that's true, but when you go work, right, uh, you may still need um, to charge your vehicle. And the reason is that the, the speed, when you charge your, your battery, it doesn't go long. I think you can go maybe 60, 70 miles. Right? And then you need to recharge again. It's not like, you know, get gas and uh, you can go up to three days. Right? So if, if you're close to your work, you're fine. But if, if you're traveling a lot, then at, at some point you may need charging stations at different locations uh, of the city. So this is a plan. And uh, I, I am hearing that they are they already started building some charging stations. And these charging stations will coordinate of course, it will, ch will charge your uh, uh, electric vehicles, but uh, will coordinate the charging. And this means we need to communicate with these charging stations. So um, we can do that through vehicular networks that is related to what um, this, to the theme of this um, workshop, right? So you will have, you already know that we have these um, wireless communication capabilities at these plant for the vehicles. And uh, once we have these onboard devices with the transmission system, so you can see um, a sample um, onboard device for a vehicle, then we can actually communicate with the uh, aggregator. Do you have a question? Yes. What do you communicate? Do they coordinate put fuel in your car, you don't communicate with the gas station. Because you have a lot of gas, right? But you need to coordinate so that you, can, you don't stress the grid. If there is a lot of um, um, vehicle charging, the question. Okay, so what is the type of communication that you want to have with the charging station? We talk to them to have a slot. It's like schedule. I want to come. This are you available for this amount of battery and for this amount of time? I need to immediately this because charging is not like two minutes. Ahead. It takes it takes hours. So this is the drive have to decide when we take the car from there. So this is the last one. Yeah. Maybe in the future we'll have fast chargers. They are working on it. But right now it takes a lot of time. Uh, so that's one thing and uh, did you see that uh, example um, of a potential future charging station? Um, 
And we will have a lot of them, and we, we need to coordinate with them. Because this aggregator, the, 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 key, the key term there is the aggregator. Because uh, initially I said that if for one particular vehicle it's not a problem, right? But then you have a lot of thousands of vehicles, so the aggregate load, that's a problem. Of course, there's, there's another um, possibility here, which is called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle charging. So we have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, and in the future we'll have vehicle-to-vehicle. -vehicle. So what does that mean? You can actually sell um, power to someone else. Uh, that is also possible right now. I mean, if you go to the charging station, you can actually um, transfer. You can do transfer. Um, so you need to go to the charging station. But in the future, maybe there, there might be mechanisms to, to do it anywhere. For instance, there is this option of wireless charging. Um, probably you heard it. Um, we're using it in the, in the sensor network community, I don't know, wireless charging. It is possible, um, although it's just uh, primitive. You know, if, if you're very close, like, I don't know, maybe half a meter, uh, you can do wireless charging, although it's, it's very slow. Here. I think that the, I doubt if someone wants to be in the, between these two cars during the charging. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I saw that uh, there was a presentation was saying there are different technologies and then the maximum like maybe a meter something like that. So it needs to be very very close. Um, there are different different technologies to do it. I'm uh, still working on it. Um, so this this is uh, uh, how we can communicate. Um, so the idea here is, well, via vehicular networks, you know, there's a lot of research uh, ongoing, the safe side, but can we um, also add the grid side, side? So there are different architectures available. We can use those aggregators um, to uh, communicate with the vehicles. Or we have these roadside units in, in vehicular ad hoc networks, right? So can we communicate through through those, um, how can we implement this communication um, with the grid? That's that's the question. So there are a number of options. I would like to go through those options, starting from the the, the current vehicle or So we already know about this, and uh, maybe a lot of you already published um, in this workshop about. Um, this communication architecture and standards. So we have this VA-NET, vehicle networks, consisting of vehicles and roadside units, and that's part of the um, 811P or DSRC or VAE. So these standards were there for maybe 10 years, right? Uh, and the main goal here, though, was safety, right? Um, there are, of course, other applications, but We'd like to make sure that we minimize the pollutions, accidents. Um, there is also the, the goal of um, traffic, route optimization, etc. So we are not talking to grid um, with this uh, type of networks. So you know, uh, 8.11p was the standard uh, communication was um, suggested to use on board um, for the vehicles was approved in 2010, and still um, there was tests, as far as I read, I was discussing with Somaya about the current status, but uh, I know that we don't have anything on the road yet. So uh, the, the Federal Department of Transportation, they have a testing facility, it extensively tested this, um, and it has been five years are still being tested or maybe done. Maybe we'll see it in the future, but although they, there's a lot of papers, a lot of research, we don't have any product yet. What was the impression that uh, DSRC was supposed to be mandated on the full story next year, I think, in the US? I haven't heard that. Okay, so Maya was also mentioned that. Right. Um, I am Hearing that there, there, there might be um, other political um, issues, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's uh, that's there. But it's, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that this is really delayed. 2010 was, was approved, and 
we were expecting, I remember I, I was doing research in 2008 um, using this standard. It was already available in, in, and there was this NS2 simulation uh, already implemented. So there's been a lot, I mean, almost 10 years that you don't have a product so that it seems like there's a, there's a problem with the uh, automotive, automotive in industry. Um, and it, it can be this problem. So this is the alternative. The alternative that they offer is based on LTE. So LTE is picking up a lot. Uh, it's everywhere. It's, it's a nice technology. Uh, so they are trying to um, come up with machine to machine or they call device to device communication with LTE as well, right? And one of their applications is um, uh, vehicular communications. And uh, recently, there's this 3GPP standardization group. They initiated, initiated a, a new study item called uh, LTE support for V2X services. So it will be built on this uh, functionality called proximity services, ProC, so that that is V2D communication between two um, cellular devices. So it doesn't go through the base station. It doesn't make sense, right? I mean, if, if I, I would like to talk to someone here by cell phone, it goes through the base station, right? So they, they want to do it um, D to D, and this is called the Pro C uh, feature, and they would like to improve the spectral efficiency, throughput, and latency, etc. Uh, and here's what they envisioned. They're, they're, they're considering three types of communication. Vehicle to vehicle, that's what we are discussing. They're also considering vehicle to pedestrian and vehicle to network. That's, that's part of our vehicle to infrastructure, like talking to uh, roadside units. So this is not there yet. It's, they're working on it. They just started. Uh, and um, I am thinking that once it's there, it may be um, picking up better than um, ESRC because last year we have seen that Ford and GM they have already uh, built LTE capable vehicles, so they are on the roll. And of course, here the, the main goal is uh, this infotainment applications. They call it infotainment. So on the vehicle you're watching video on YouTube, right? So it's it's an internet connection. Um, but this can surely be used for um, vehicle to grid communication or vehicle to vehicle um, and uh, it might be a bit of better technology right so there's there's a big fight right now with LT and, and Wi-Fi so and there is also this um, effort for uh, coming up with unlicensed LT right unlicensed LT means you know that they need more bands Right? They want to also use uh, unlicensed bands. Plus, they want to use the, the bands from the Department of Defense. Like, uh, the, 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 there are bands specifically uh, dedicated to radars, for instance. Never used, just for certain locations. Now they're opening it to um, LTE. They will sell and they will share it with uh, telecommunication companies. So that means that there's, there's, there's a lot going on with LTE and then 5G is coming up. So this can be another viable alternative. So when we look at it, what are our options? Or what, what are the communication channels and op options? So we see vehicle to vehicle, right? I talked about that for vehicle to vehicle charging. And uh, right now we have this 811P, right? That's already there. Can be an option. Can be used. Um, you can also use Wi-Fi Direct because it's a broadcast, right? Another option. Or I was talking about LTE Pro C. So with this vehicle to vehicle, it's like it's an application like okay, I need battery power. I'm broadcasting a message to my neighborhood, and if somebody's interested to sell to me, you know, I'll do that, right? So that's just just a broadcast. Uh, the other one is vehicle to aggregator, and um, that is that that can be done with um, P 11.P as well, and uh, LT is another option there. 
right? So it's vehicle to infrastructure, and then from aggregator to the utility. So we need to connect the, 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 to the power grid uh, in terms of two networks. One is the uh, energy network, and the other is the communication network, because you need to be part of that network in order to sell and buy, right? So there we can use uh, LTE or AMI. AMI is the feature infrastructure. Um, or PLC is a power line communication. So utilities are right now they are using heavily dependent on this power line communication, which is very old technology, very slow, but it's still there. It's part of their infrastructure, so they are utilizing it. Okay. Now, after this background, I'd like to talk about you know, what are the security and privacy issues here that are of interest to us as as networking um, researchers. So you may already heard about these security concerns with the OEA nets. Uh, you know, these are classical security problems in every type of wireless network applications. Um, and they, ha they are heavily studied. So we have authentication of the senders of messages, especially this is very important with, with VA nets. Um, but there's also this privacy, location privacy to when you, uh, is it right when you move it around, you know, network that is broadcasting your location, uh, which is being done by, 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 uh, by the 11P standard, uh, basically you're exposing your location, right? So there's a privacy concern and there's a conflict here with, with authentication and privacy, so how can you design privacy preserving authentication, etc. Non-repudiation and another thing is if, if uh, you send a safety message and create an accident, uh, cause an accident. Uh, who will be responsible for this, so you need to have non-repudiation availability, is it if there's a, a jamming attack to, to your safety messages. So all of these are classical problems. There's nothing new here. And lots of papers already published, right? Um, so what, what do we have uh, as, a, as a new security um, research in B2G? Not much, really. Uh, similar similar uh, issues. Um, the only maybe different issue here is the secure transactions because you need to buy and sell. So selling is, is maybe more uh, interesting here because you need to be paid, right? So how can they pay to you? We don't know yet. Um, so we need to have a authentication, confidentiality, and integrity uh, in terms of your information. So because you, you have your battery status, uh, you have... Um, uh, like how much you want to buy, your credit card information, these kind of things need to be communicated to the grid. And you need to have that confidentiality and integrity to make sure that nobody is you know, changing or, or trying, to, trying to steal um, power or, or um, um, you know, authentic, uh, authentication problems, etc. Right? So these are new challenges that we can study uh, as part of B2G. Maybe privacy concerns are more interesting here uh, because it, it again comes back to the uh, location privacy in, in vehicle and networks. So we need to do a lot of coordination. This is part of the, the um, B2G communication. We need to coordinate how, how you can um, uh, charge your battery, right? Or discharge. So this, this, this means you're going to expose a lot of information um, to, for those algorithms to run. And uh, since uh, we have a short driving range uh, for the electric vehicles, we need to charge a lot. So that means you, know, you need to communicate a lot. And when you communicate, you're exposing a lot of information in addition to your location, your charging time, amount of battery charge available, which is called state of charge SOC, the amount of power uh, you need, and then, you know, maybe the, the, the priority, like when do you need it, etc. So all of these information can be used to track the users, to learn their behaviors, to, to see what they are doing, their patterns, etc. Right? So it's, uh, it's more than uh, the, the, the privacy concerns here is more serious than in, in vehicular networks. In vehicular networks, it's just, you know, you're driving and your location right here, but maybe you can um, 
they can learn about your habits as well. So that um, that that uh, creates research opportunities for us, for researchers, uh, to to come up with um, solutions. Existing solutions, uh, of course, as I said, this is this is a mature area. Uh, from the VANet perspective, there's there was a lot of research, uh, and uh, there was a standard. You know, probably have heard about it. IEEE uh, 16092. This is a secure standard for WAVE and has been um, completed and used for uh, 11P. So it provides uh, the signatures, uses public key infrastructure, uses pseudonyms for providing privacy, and you know all all those security services are there. There was a lot of interesting research initially uh, for broadcast authentication, for instance. This is Tesla, Tesla Plus Plus from Carnegie Mellon. So they're trying to secure um, the, the broadcast because since it's a broadcast, it, it's, you don't have um, authentication mechanisms for it. Uh, so that was a, uh, one of the um, earliest research uh, and, and widely used uh, approach right now. The main concern there was the real-time constraints of vehicular networks because you don't really have time. It's it's crucial safety applications. Um, for safety applications, there's this real-time constraints of um, authenticating the users, etc. Uh, from the LTE perspective, if you look at it, there's not much there. You know, if we plan to use LTE, uh, there's no existing standard for you know security in in D2G. There is, they, they have their own security standards, but not applied to here. Okay, maybe quickly, uh, I don't know how much time, not much. <laughs> uh, I'd like to just talk about our recent research um, about privacy preserving power charging coordination. So there's this coordination algorithm, I don't want to get into that, but I would like to talk about how to uh, hide information from the aggregators and, and um, from the utility maybe. Um, so there's, there's no standard for privacy right now. Uh, we would like to um, hide our information from, of course, outside attackers. But that's easy. The problem is the insiders, right? Uh, so that's the challenge. Um, so you'd like to hide your information, uh, but at the same time, you need to have this coordination for charging. So there's a trade-off here. This trade-off is, is explored by researchers a lot. Uh, privacy utility trade-off. So if you would like privacy, right, you don't provide any information, which is nice, but then you don't provide any information, then you don't get that um, good optimization results, right? You don't get um, uh, good uh, charging schemes because it requires a lot of information. So this is a trade-off, a general trade-off recently for all cyber-physical systems. So if you, if you want more privacy, probably the quality that you get will go down. So that's what we wanted to show here. And also we wanted to show um, how we can hide information. Because um, otherwise this, this can create problems in terms of adoption of these electric vehicles, right? Because we're just starting. And if, if people know that you know this creates a lot of uh, privacy issues, they may be hesitant to, to use it. So I don't know if, if I need to maybe quickly go over this or um, move on to the research opportunities. But what we did was um, based on this model. So you have vehicles, uh, and they are sending their information to an aggregator for charging coordination and we are considering different communities and um, all charging coordination is done by there's a centralized charging controller collecting this information and making decisions right so as a vehicle uh, you are sending some information to the aggregator um, let me pass that here so you're, you're sending some data of course, you're encrypting that data. So the, the data that you see, V, V, T, S, V, like when do you want to charge, you know, how much do you need, your priority, etc. And you would like to hide this information from the aggregator. The aggregator should not 
know this because if they know it, they can um, track you, right? So we are, of course, encrypting that information. And uh, the aggregator will then forward that information to the uh, charging coordinator. And uh, you see this um, information encrypted, and we are creating a key for the charging coordinator, symmetric key, so that that encrypted information can be open, can be decrypted at the charging uh, controller, and then do computations. Right. So let me show this maybe um, this one here. So basically, that's the, the RV is the information that we provided to the aggregator. And then you get the next from all of the vehicles and then put them all together and send to the controller. And then the controller will use this key, um, key D, and uh, decrypt that information and then do the, the run the algorithm, the coordination algorithm, provide the output here, of course sign it so that the aggregator will not see it, send it back. And for the aggregator, uh, for, I'm sorry, for the uh, charging controller, we're doing this shuffling at the aggregator. So everybody has a pseudonym, don't use uh, their, their different um, IDs, and we're shuffling them at the aggregator as well. So there's a the request, uh, initial request, but we're, we're shuffling them at the aggregator so that you know the request will, will change, and uh, this way will be, will be much challenging for the um, uh, central uh, coordinator to identify each particular um, vehicle. And then the shuffling is, is performed when you received um, the, the request back. So this, this was the result I wanted to show. So when you would like to, don't want to provide exact information about your state of battery, completion time, etc., want to introduce some noise. So you don't want to be a little um, noisy to protect your privacy, right? So when you do that, we, we, we checked how that affects the quality of uh, um, charging. So this is the average charge that you get uh, per vehicle. And there are different schemes. And this one, the baseline, of course, is not doing well. But just look at the, the other ones as comparing when we add noise. So when you add 10% noise to your data, you can see that the quality is, is going down. So the, the blue one is the, the, the one without noise, but when you add more noise, especially for these two types of data, 20% to that yellow one. So the quality is really going down. So it's a matter of, you know, if you want more privacy, then uh, you may expect that, that type of um, quality problems in terms of charging coordination. Okay, what are the open issues? Quickly, uh, I would like to go over them. Uh, I've talked about payment systems. This is one interesting issue. So before uh, charging, you need to make sure that that's a legitimate vehicle and has enough money in the account. And uh, the account should be updated. So um, the, the, the issue here is a privacy preser preservation. And at the same time, the payment should be done, or you pay or you, you, you get paid, right? So how can you design privacy-preserving payment systems? LTE Secure, I talk about that. So Secure and Privacy, nothing there about uh, LTE. Uh, it has its own security mechanisms, but we need like SSL-like protocols for end-to-end -end connection establishment for vehicle-to-vehicle, -to -vehicle. and we need secure broadcasts like Tesla, would, would the idea of Tesla work there? We don't know. Um, and by the way, LTE people, they don't really, they, they focus on communication, they don't really care much about privacy and security. Um, another, maybe minor issue, secure multicasting, which has been studied in, in other domains, but here, <coughs> I'd like to use it with P or LTE. There's no support for multicasting. If, if uh, an aggregator would like to talk to a number of vehicles, uh, a group, this is not possible. It's, it's broadcast. So we need multicasting support. We need security for that, of course. Um, key management is a classical problem. And here, the problem is that um, we are using different platforms. And uh, 
different communications, so how can you have a, a common um, key management? Testing tools, another issue, there's a lot of simulation research, of course, you don't have that ability to test it in actual vehicles, right? So there are simulator tools like in this tree, they're used for communication and security, but we need to integrate maybe scheduling mechanisms, coordinating uh, of char coordination of charging with these tools so that we can see the net effect. Of course, actual test pads are uh, needed. Um, there is a lot of testing going on with connected cars at some universities, I know. So those can be used for um, these kind of security and communication research. Um, testing in actual charging stations. Actually, there was a, an emulator that was built in, in our university. Uh, I'm collaborating with the power system people. Um, so this is how it looks like. You can see that the, the vehicles, um, they are, you know, there's, a, there's a bus, an EC bus, an EC bus that they connect to the grid. And they have their uh, slots here to charge. But uh, you also need a communication with the aggregator. So they have this um, communication signal that can be implemented in different ways. And of course, that aggregator needs to communicate with the um, the outside world, which can be through LTE or, or you know, uh, 11P. So um, we need to be able to test uh, in, in these kind of mechanisms uh, by considering the actual uh, charging issues as well. Okay, so to wrap up, I can tell that this has a great potential because uh, there is a lot of funding available for smart grid, especially in the US, I don't know the other countries, because our system was very, very old, so they, up, they need, it needed an upgrade, and there, there is a lot of push from the Department of Energy for securing the smart grid, and part of it is the electric vehicles, so there is, uh, there is a lot of funding available here. So we'll see more applications and research in the upcoming years, um, so it, there's there's different parts of it, right? So the, the networking part, vehicular networking, which we do, and there's also the, the, the physical part. So it's like a cyber physical. It's considered as a cyber physical system, where the the cyber is the communications that we do, but there's also the charging, um, and it's 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 impact on the grid. That's the physical uh, part. So um, there will be a lot of um, the need for the data uh, for uh, the vehicles, this, these electric vehicles selling power to the grid or using renewables, how that affect. So these kind of um, things will need some data analysis um, research as well. Uh, eventually what I can tell is that this is an interdisciplinary work within the engineering, of course. Uh, so it, it requires people from power systems, communications, computer science, uh, security, so that, that can actually um, bring um, more opportunities in terms of uh, specific problems because we just look at the communication part or security part, but we don't really, we don't know the real system, um, what's going on there. So it, it will be good to collaborate with those uh, people who are expert in those areas. Okay, so I think we have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. I can get questions.
time, so yeah. you want to be able to run out of it. Yeah, so yeah. So it's really instead of conflicting, but I think there is some good potential there for the charge controller to actually learn over time how a specific region behave mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then schedule the charge exactly, yeah. the values. Uh, so, yeah, that might be called some uh, machine learning yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay, so, I'm sort of looking 1500 years in the future, and people talk of self-driving cars, and yeah. people not actually owning cars, they sort of have a platoon yeah, of cars, cars. Which, which will just come to your doorstep when you need them. Do you think privacy and some of these issues would still be a challenge then, or will sort of yeah, no matter the driver then? I don't think so. Maybe, you know, maybe s s some of these problems will disappear, but maybe new ones will come. It will always be there, but um, it, it, it really depends on the sensitivity of the people. So some people, as long as you know, they care and they want it, it will be there. But um, you know, I, I remember Peter was saying that you know, if um, I don't care about privacy and, and I don't want to pay like one dollar a month <laughs> for it. So, so for people, for some people, that yeah, makes sense. But you never know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.